Teaching sometimes helps us identify where our deficits are. I had a student ask a question pertaining to the Euclidean space in dimensions three and higher. I only had diversions. I didn't have an answer. In this video, I hope to be able to convey what a Euclidean space is, and this should work for dimensions one and higher. I have two objectives. I would like to identify what a Euclidean space is, and then I would also like to talk about what the difference between a Euclidean space in general is versus plane geometry, which is a Euclidean space, but more focused that you typically see in a high school class. A quote that goes along with what I've just said uh, by George Jennings in his book Modern Geometry with Applications is his quote, it seems to me that students of geometry, especially prospective mathematics teachers, need to be aware of how geometry is used as well as how it is derived, end quote. This really speaks to what I am involved with. All the students that I had in the class where that question was asked were teachers in training. I think maybe only two of them perhaps were focused on high school, but it doesn't really matter what their focus was. They were in a geometry class and I didn't have a good answer to the question, what is a Euclidean space? We're going to use a bold E to the N power to represent an N-dimensional Euclidean space. We really want this to be, the N to be natural numbers starting with one and going as large as you would like. A Euclidean space is going to be homogeneous so it's the same everywhere. It's not going to have a natural coordinate system the way that we're putting this together, and it's not going to have distinguished points. This helps to add to that uniformity. Uh, important ideas in Euclidean space are identified by Jennings as measurement and as orientation. Measurement we can immediately gather from two of the postulates that we have with Euclidean geometry. We get a ruler postulate and an, a protractor postulate. These allow us to measure linear distances and angles. Uh, the way that I have this particular postulate written, we see the alignment with a degree measurement but this is a postulate out of a book that I used to teach out of. When we talk about orientation, we're talking about when we start to look at a rotation, whether it be rays opening to give us an angle, or if we're moving around a circle, or if we're taking an object and we're turning it, we have to know which direction we are going to turn as kind of a baseline. We see in trigonometry and possibly other mathematics that we tend to move anti-clockwise. We simply just need to define what we're going to use for our rotation and be consistent throughout our studies of this geometry. For this discussion, we will assume anti-clockwise is the rotation that we're going to use, but it really isn't going to affect us in the discussion that we have here. When we look at geometry with a baseline of anti-clockwise versus clockwise, it's not going to change the things that we can discover about the geometry. Certain things may need to be stated in a slightly different way, but they're going to be uh, equivalent ideas. The next thing that we are going to establish is a metric or a way to measure within the geometric space that we're discussing. Now you'll see this formula here. It will work for dimensions one and higher. So we have a very general form. 
what is traditionally seen in a high school is a two-dimensional form with Cartesian coordinates. So we have a point with an XY coordinate, we have a second point with an XY coordinate, and then we plug them into the distance formula and we have a distance. Now this is a positive value because we are looking at distance traveled from one point to another point in this geometric space. So we are looking at positive numbers only. You will notice that if you're in one dimension, you're on a straight line or a number line within this geometric space that you're just moving straight down the line. It's important to have the squaring and the square rooting process in there because you can generate some negative numbers in there and the squaring process will eliminate those negative numbers. We take the square root and then we come back to the actual linear distance. It essentially gives us the absolute value. As we move into higher dimensions, we have some nice properties that we can start to observe are going to work in general. These properties that we see that if we are at the same point, we essentially haven't moved any distance, so the distance between the two points is zero. So we have an equality statement. Otherwise, there's going to be some distance between those, so the distance is going to be uh, greater than zero. Again, we're not going to have negative values because we are looking at distance traveled in a geometric space, so there's no negative movement. The next thing that we should see is that we have some kind of a symmetric property here where if I start at B and move to A, or if I start at A and move to B, being a linear movement, we should have the same distance from B to A as we have from A to B. So we have that symmetric distance measurement there. And then lastly, we have this nice inequality that tells us that if we look at a triangle, that two sides of the triangle are added together are going to be greater than the third side or equal to it. You can easily see this if you draw a generic right triangle, although it doesn't have to be a right triangle, you can see that the base and the height added together are going to be greater than the hypotenuse. You will notice though that this is written as an inequality that has equals as a possibility. Where is this the case? This is the case for a degenerate triangle, which essentially lies along a line. It essentially will look like a line segment. Now this doesn't work well in a high school geometry because high school geometry mostly stays within a plane, a two-dimensional Euclidean space. A line is not unique in a single plane since a line is the intersection of two or more planes. So when we have a degenerate triangle, we can't pin it down to one specific plane. Since we can't pin the degenerate triangle down to one specific plane, it is something that we can just not deal with specifically in a plane geometry. It is certainly something that can be addressed and is something that students may discover on their own and have questions about, and then we can have those discussions. Having these three specific properties, along with some of the other things that go into defining other parts of our space, this becomes a part of a metric space, so that is a specific other discussion that we could have, we're going to need some things along with these three properties, but that is not the focus of our discussion. We are not discussing what is a metric space. We want to know what is a Euclidean space. So at this point, we have this geometric space that is homogeneous. We can have points in it, but we don't have anything that is specifically defined that we need to talk about as far as like an origin. And we have this metric, we have a way to measure within the geometric space. Now that we have a way to measure, we have a place where objects can live. Once we have an object in a Euclidean space, we can move that object. The way to move a 
object in a Euclidean space is to define a function which takes all the points from one object and maps it into another object. The object that we start with we call the pre-image. The object that we end with we will call the image. You can think of the image portion when you think of a camera. When you take a picture you have an image that appears on the screen. What happened before you had an image? The pre-image was the object that you were taking a picture of. So these terminologies can be kind of grasped as we think of a camera. When we have this pre-image and image where all the distances and angle measures are preserved, we call this an isometry. And there is a very specific and precise definition that we can add to this. I have the definition from Jennings' book here. In geometry, in general, and you also see it in an algebra discussion, we have four basic transformations. We have a translation where we move an object from one place to another. Essentially, we just slide it. Nothing is distorted. So you just pick it up and drop it somewhere else. The next thing that we can have is we can have a reflection. We can take that object, reflect it over a line, and the objects are essentially the same, only the points become reversed. But we've maintained the distances and the angle measures, so we have, essentially, you could have picked it up, flipped it over, and laid it down. And then lastly, we have a rotation. You could spin it in place, or you can choose a point and rotate it around that point. These are considered rigid motions because essentially you can pick them up without deforming the object and put them somewhere else and they are the same. They just occupy a different place in geometric space. We would call this congruent. The last basic transformation is dilation. This will essentially stretch or contract sides, but preserve the angle measure. So this is not a rigid transformation because we have this stretching or compressing that happens. So it's not something I can just pick up and put down undisturbed. So this is not a rigid transformation. This has some kind of change that occurs. So it's not going to be known as rigid transformation. It is not an isometry. This, the function that moves from the pre-image to the image does something to distort the distances between points. Hopefully this has helped bring some of the ideas of what a Euclidean space is. To recap, we have a space, a collection of points or points possible, and we can have a function that tells us the distance between points. We can talk about functions with m which move points from one location to another in the geometric space. So, looking at our distance formula from plane geometry, this tells us if we have assigned Cartesian coordinates here that we can find the distance between those two points. If we're on a number line, it's simply the number traveled between the two points along the line, and you don't necessarily need a formula for that, although you, depending on how your number line is established, it may be easier to have that. As we move into three dimensions, we can talk about cubes and other objects, and we can still move along the face or possibly interior to the cube if it is a solid, and we can find distances there, and it's going to be essentially the same distance formula. As we move into the fourth dimension and higher, these are things we can't visualize. We can make attempts at visualizing shadows and have other mental devices to use to try to get a grasp on what we're talking about, but this comes down to more algebra at that point. We extend the distance formula to add that next section in there. It's 
running, it's a summation running from the index starting at one to whatever the dimension is. So it adapts as you move up in higher dimensionality. And we have to look at this more as a algebra than a visual geometry at this point, but the formula is still going to work. Within these higher dimensional spaces, we can still move objects around, but they may be different objects than we saw at the lower dimensions. For instance, we can now have polyhedrons in three dimensions and other higher dimensional shapes as we move up. A very important key piece is this ability to measure the distance between points. Now, comparison. Euclidean space in general versus what we see mostly in high school with a plane. We have the distance formula. We have a space, it's a plane, that we can move shapes around and we easily can see the sliding effect. We can flip things over, we can rotate things around. With a little imagination, you can imagine compressing things or stretching things when we have the dilation. We can measure things. We have instruments like rulers and protractors where we can physically measure things based on whatever standard of measurement that we have, whether it be inches, centimeters, or other. So we see all of these properties that we can get a handle on. Moving into three dimensions where we kind of feel we live, I can jump up, I can squat down, I can step to my right, I can step to my left, I can step forward, and I can step backward. We, we see those movements in the X, Y, and Z direction. We now can also talk about volume. If we want to know the area taken up as we move through that third dimension, the distances are going to remain the same. If I move up the Z axis, I can use my same distance formula. If I'm strictly going from, say, X to Z, I only need those that two-dimensional piece, but if I need X, Y, and Z, we can extend that as needed. We lose the visual aspect again as we move into four dimensions and higher, and so this becomes more of an algebraic exercise. What are the differences? When we are in a two-dimensional space, the plane, there is no thickness to things. What you see drawn is it. There is no thickness, so there's no Z direction, essentially. So we don't have to worry about that depth. The two dimensions are a robust and yet somewhat simple area that we can study geometry. It's a good starting point. And we have lots of information because there has been lots of studies of two-dimensional geometry throughout history. Though we still see discoveries even in two-dimensional geometry, even into modern times, even though it has been studied for such a long time. And then it's harder for us to think about at times what happens in higher dimensionalities. Hopefully this has met our objectives here. Hopefully this has given you a better depth of this very important fundamental idea of what a Euclidean space is. Cheerful calculations.